welcome to the Alex Salmon Show. Today we feature a special interview with the former First Minister of Scotland, Henry MacLeish. 20 years ago, as a Labour Minister of State, he was piloting the Scotland Act through the House of Commons. He then became Scotland's second First Minister after the untimely death of Donald Dewar. His time at the top of Scottish politics was cut short by an expenses scandal which now seems relatively minor in light of many more recent issues. However, over the last 15 years, he has devoted himself to public service in Scotland, while also pursuing an academic career in the United States. Meanwhile, his political journey from keen devolutionist to being on the cusp of backing independence has mirrored much of Scotland. Today, Alex interviews him on his career, on the establishment of Scotland's parliament, on the European issue and Scotland, and on his thoughts in the direction of American politics under Trump. But first, to your tweets, your messages, and your emails. And first from Hazel, who says, thanks for today's Scotland the Brand theme. Your interviewee is so passionate as well as knowledgeable. Looked up the poem, Open the Doors. It bears an occasional rereading to our politicians. A nest of fairties is what they do not want. Indeed, we do not. Thank you, Hazel. Fiona says, there have been many great programmes and all informative. Today, Keep Scotland the Brand features amongst the best, getting the message of the strength and quality of Scotland across. Well done and thanks for a tasty show. Linda says, and it's the first time you've heard from Linda, oh, go on Scotland, beautiful landscape and outstanding culture, impressive parliament too. Sally says, fantastic show again, but Michael Gover's right. As a vegan, I agree with him wholeheartedly that Scotland produces great organic carrots. Yes, we do. And finally, Kenna said, great show. Regarding Scotland the brand, something that was overlooked. Our land and water are free from fracking. Good point, Kenneth. That's why the Saltar is a brand of quality. Now over to Alex, who's at College Green, just outside the House of Commons. 20 years ago, the House of Commons chamber was not dominated by Brexit, but by Scotland. And the man steering that devolution legislation through was Henry MacLeish. Now under the UK government's plans for Brexit, many believe that the principles of devolution encompassed in that legislation are under threat as never before. Indeed, that battle between the UK and Scottish administrations is now being played out in front of the Supreme Court. I first asked Henry MacLeish how he remembered that campaign to establish the modern Scottish Parliament. Henry, you had a long career in Labour Party politics uh, in the citadel of, uh, of Central Fife. Uh, you had some interesting uh, political opponents over the years. All of them came and all of them went. I certainly have, and uh, one of the most bizarre um, incidents was when I hosted the young Rhys Mogg. This is uh, Jacob Rhys Mogg. Jacob Rhys Mogg, not his illustrious father. So he came up to kind of um, get some experience politically, so he f fought me for four weeks. Of course, he, he went down very badly. But what was interesting was my job during the campaign was to save him from places in Fife save him from people that were going to just abuse him. So I, I was, uh, he welcomed that. So at the end of the contest, his father, who was a very distinguished, William Rees Mogg, the editor of the Times, he wrote me this letter saying, Dear Mr McLeish, I don't normally write to Labour MPs in this way, but thanks very much for chaperoning uh, my young son in his first political outburst. Now, I think if I'd known then what I know now, I wouldn't have been so... So you're responsible for, for, a, the, for Brexit, probably. I can announce on your programme that I am responsible for Rees Mogg in his present form. But can you imagine a situation where you see him today described in the House of Commons as the, the honourable member from the 18th century. Imagine a young Rhys Mogg with a double-breasted suit. <laughs> it, when I reflect on it, it was quite an experience for me as well. In 1997, uh, you were elected, they became uh, uh, Donald Joe's right-hand man to deliver the devolution commitment into the referendum campaign, the, the double-question campaign. What's your uh, essential memories of that? Well, it was a great campaign in many ways. I mean, you know, we knew that the white paper, which was a very good white paper, was going to be well received by Scots. It was good to see Sean Connery and <clears throat> Gordon Brown sitting in the same boat as they crossed from one side of Edinburgh to one side of Fife. But it was also the historic part of it, because here was a great nation for the first time in, since 1707, getting some substantial powers, some real powers, being recognised, as I suggested at that time. So it was good to be part of the legislation, good to take it to the House. it was a remarkable campaign. I mean, uh, 
talk about Sean Carr, you and I spoke with him in the, the Royal High School, which was the original site of the, the Scottish Parliament that was meant to be in the, in the 1970s. And, and so we've both done a, a public meeting, a political meeting with Sean Connery. No, and I think the good thing about that, Alec, was there was a you know, coming together of Scotland at that time. You know, we all had our differences, you know, the SNP, Labour, the Greens, whatever. But nevertheless, you just felt at that moment in 97, in that uh, September, that this is a, there was a unity of purpose around. It was a good feeling. I think even the weather might have been good. But it did, you know, s set us on a road now, of course, which is continuing to unfold. So on to the Parliament, reconvened, as, uh, as, as Winnie Ewing uh, said in, in 1999, uh, Donald Jew as First Minister. Uh, but not the Parliament building we have now. It was the temporary Parliament up in the mound, the Assembly Hall of the, of the Church of Scotland. Yeah. No, I mean, it, it was good to get... I mean, if you look at the, the sequence, you know, in 97 we got the, the white paper through, we got the Act through in 98, and, of course, the opening of the Parliament with Her Majesty the Queen um, uh, up in the old church building in, in 99. So that was a great two years in the life of Scotland, in the history of Scotland. But it was also, I think, when I look back on it, when I took the bill through the floor of the house, and you know the floor of the house quite well, I spent 120 hours at the dispatch box. And the nearest I came to grief was when one of the Conservatives threw the Scotsman newspaper at me. Um, but apart from Did that, it, it was plain sailing. No, I didn't. So the and then in the, the parliament gets get, gets going and that young pesky leader of the opposition decides to resign. So it looks all that was me. It looks all plain sailing for for yourself. Then tragedy struck, of course, with with Donald Dewar's uh, untimely death. You have a tight contest with uh, Jack McConnell to to become first minister, but become first minister with great goodwill behind you. And you set about some of your uh, key projects uh, like free personal care for the the elderly. You must have. Quite a struggle, I suspect, with the civil service and delivering that. Well, you know, from your own experience, getting something new through is very, very difficult. There was scepticism on the part of the civil service. A lot of my political colleagues were not very supportive because they had bought this idea that nothing, nothing should be free at the point of need. Now, jumping back to your career, well, some of the great points in Scottish life has been that uh, free tuition fees. Not free tuition fees, but free at the point of need. You know, breaking new, uh, breaking down barriers. So free personal care for me was something. And you know, one of the benefits was to see it actually happen in my own home. My father, who sadly died, uh, he had dementia. And he got the benefit of some of the provisions that we had put through in the Scottish Parliament about free personal care. And when people think of the, the Parliament, when they ask the question, which is often asked, what has the Scottish Parliament done for us? That would be right at the, the top of the, of the list of of validations of having your own parliament? Well, I think when you look at Jack's period, you know, the ban on smoking in public places, I think we were the fourth country in the world. Free personal care, free tuition fees, and also now trying to stop the excesses of alcohol. We're putting a tax on that at the, the, the point of sale. That couldn't have happened at Westminster. This could only happen in Scotland with a more progressive society saying, look, we need to do these things. But it never could happen at Westminster. I know one of my features today, my sad, sad memories of Westminster, is it really hasn't moved on much. Then you were embroiled in a, a strange expenses uh, issue because it was really a hangover from Westminster, nothing to do with the Scots Parliament. Looking back and taking it in proportion, do you think now, looking back, given all the seen, that sort of thing should have been survivable? Because I certainly did at the time. Indeed, I told you at the time I thought it was survivable. I think that's very true, and I look at what's happened since then and various things. But it happened at a moment in time, Alec. Um, I had to react to that moment in time, and I felt in the best interest of everyone that I should just decide um, to resign. It, it certainly wasn't easy. Uh, there were some dark moments running up to that and of course after that there was a question of rehabilitation and I've always believed in terms of public service, I've always believed since I stepped down that public service is still me and I've hopefully put into sc Scottish politics, Scottish life, a lot of the stuff that I might have done if I'd remained in politics. So I'm not too regretful of what happened, things could always be different. But you never make progress if you dwell in the past. So that, that, that must have been a, a real, you know, what do I do next? How do I recover from that? How do I find a, a, new, a new goal and mission? So how did, you, how did you cope with that? Well, it was difficult. The immediate period was difficult just uh, getting over the, what had happened. But then I said to myself, you know, you've been a public servant all your life. Continue to be one. So as First Minister, I called in your services, I think first for the Prisons Commission, if I remember correctly, where, where I was very troubled with the... Uh, 
the number of people incarcerated in Scotland, obviously overcrowded prisons, and looking for a, a looking for how to achieve a consensus to say that these short sentences actually do nobody any good, least of all the prisoners and least of all society. Uh, and you came. So, do you feel that what came forward from that prison commission has, has been put into effect? It has, but I think the results have been slightly disappointing for me because I think the idea was that you know the, the only way you can tackle prison problems is to have less people in prison. I think you underrate the achievement and we can only look at the achievement relative to what's happened yeah. south of the border. Yeah. My first two, three years as First Minister, uh, the Justice Secretary Kenny McCaskill was coming virtually to every cabinet meeting to report that the, the prison population had exceeded tolerable limits yeah. in a, a certain occasion and how we we're going to find the accommodation etc. It doesn't happen now, and it doesn't happen because although the prison population hasn't been drastically reduced, we haven't seen the, the constant increases yeah. which were, were there previously at a time, of course, where recorded crime has fallen dramatically. Yeah. But I think the point is, and you'll, you'll appreciate this in terms of progressive politics, I expect more of Scotland. You know, we have been a very punitive country in so many ways. It's changed dramatically, but as far as I'm concerned, I'd like to do uh, another review just now unsolicited as it were, which could say, look, this is what we need to do next. But we've made progress, but in my view, not enough for a country that aspires to be Nordic in relation to what it might want to do in criminal justice. That's a, that's a goal for us. But if you can claim some progress in yeah. prisons, perhaps not quite as much in Scottish football, which was one of your other great commission tasks, reorganising the structure of Scottish football. Well, you know, at every function I go to, I say that I try and do two things in my life. One is to try and get the Labour Party elected and secondly to save Scottish football. It depend, I, looking forward, I'm not sure I might be successful with either, but I've just put the finishing touches to a new book that will be published uh, at the Book Festival in August and it's basically the future of Scottish football, Requiem of Renaissance. I hope this is a reasonably sized book if it's about the future of Scottish football. <laughs> it is and it's got more dreams in it this time and casting our memories back to the golden age between the 70s, 80s and early 90s. But uh, I think the Prison Commission report is probably more progressive and has achieved more than maybe my book or my previous review had done in football. Now you've been in a almost unique position of being at the very top of Scottish politics uh, at a time where I think it would be reasonable to say you saw devolution as an alternative to independence, albeit not necessarily a final settlement, not cast in stone, to a period during the independence referendum of 2014, where as we both know, I tried extremely hard Indeed. to uh, shove you over the line, yeah. as it were, because I knew how sympathetic you'd become to the independence case, to a situation now where you're recasting your view in the light of Brexit, something which you know, 10 years ago, neither you or I would have thought particularly feasible that the UK would desert the, uh, the, the European structures. How has that journey been for you? Well, um, not surprisingly, I'm, I, I'm still on it. But the point you raise is a very important one. I mean, the sadness about I mean, Brexit is just a, a, a collective act of self-harm, you know, as, as Michael Bloomfield said, you know, an act of real stupidity. And we're going to suffer and pay for that. But We've had to concentrate on the customs union, the single market, the trade ideas, the economy issues. But you know, the, the issue is much bigger than that. And my interest now is to see that it's all about our politics, our democracy, our governance in Britain. We're not being governed well. And you know, to suggest that the Conservative government is doing well is now just a bit of a joke. On the other hand, I think things will change for the simple reason that people will look beyond Brexit now and think, do they want to be in the UK? where we can have such turmoil, where real political issues are disregarded and we are about to be run or influenced by people like Rhys Mogg, Boris Johnson. So I think that's going to change because my view is, Alec, that at the time when the SNP, 2014 and since, I don't think you can get to a yes vote for independence if you stick by traditional nationalism, traditional identity, nationality issues. You've got to reach out to a wider public. So put it like I this. I tried a bit of that. You, know. you did, you did. <laughs> But the, no, but now I think it's more appropriate. Let's take the concept of the breakup of Britain. In Northern Ireland, it is a catastrophe about to happen that all the good work that was done by Major and Blair may go asunder if we have a border. You have a situation where demographic, demographics might mean that the Northern Ireland population may vote sometime in the future to be a united Ireland, point one. Secondly, you have a situation in Scotland where a lot of Scots are telling me that they're looking into Westminster and they can't believe that this can carry on for decades into the future. So I think there's a reappraisal in Scotland, not diminishing what's been achieved, 
but adding to it. And then if you even look at London, London may be crying out in the future for a new regional uh, federal structure for Britain because it's part of this and we're part of a pantomime that just cannot continue. But I think over the next few months, the next few years, you'll see a maturing of the debate about how Britain's governed, about our politics and about our democracy. And if, when you look at some of those issues, you may want to come to a different conclusion in Scotland and possibly Ireland than you did before. Join us after the break for more fascinating insights from Scotland's second First Minister, Henry McLeish, being interviewed by the fourth, Alex Salmond. Welcome back. In the second part of our interview with Henry McLeish, we turn to what Brexit means for the constitutional future of Scotland and for his view on Trumpian America. Now, looking at the turmoil over the last few weeks, uh, the continuing turmoil, perhaps we should say, in the in the House of Commons. Now, you were in the House of Commons in some pretty uh, gritty times. The Maastricht debates, for example, yeah. a number of debates which split political parties. But had you in your time in the House of Commons ever witnessed anything to, to even compare remotely with what we're seeing now? No, no. And I think if people are asked that question and reply honestly, then they will confirm. I have never seen in my political life such Pick my words carefully, such a farce, such a continuing fiasco. And you know, the, the source of this is essentially, as you well know, that Thatcher lost her head because of um, Europe. Uh, John Major lost his head. Cameron lost his head. And Theresa May is heading the same way. The I mean, as in the sense of having it chopped off. Absolutely. The poison, Politically. The, the, poison in the, the Conservative Party has spilled over. And then we had the spectacle of David Cameron trying to renegotiate, which was bogus, and then he lets the country loose on a referendum. And to use a Trump term, a rigged referendum. And to me, the tragedy is that this was never about the EU, this was about the United Kingdom. You know, this was about the state of the United Kingdom, not about the state of Europe. And then what you had was a succession of cheap patriots, as I described them, um, um, people who were either delusional in government, ideological in government, and when you combine those qualities together, this is a pretty dangerous situation. I was remarking on um, to, to, to one uh, constituent about The Handmaiden's Tale, which is a, a programme on about dystopian America. This is dystopian Britain. We're moving to places, Alec, which are not good, and the consequences of this mess. And I always thought that court jesters were wheeled out um, by kings for entertainment. But when you have the court jesters running the place, that's a different problem. And previously, when a, a government has been falling apart, like the major government, yeah. the, then the opposition gets itself into a position where it looks like it's ready to assume power. Even friends of the, uh, the Corbyn wing of the Labour Party wouldn't say it's in that condition at the present moment. No, and, and this, is, this is why I think it's a crisis, because you could conceivably have a general election six months, a year ahead, where the Conservatives could win. Now, my mind suggests that that would be bizarre, but that's the nature of British politics. There would be no guarantee in that election that Labour would win. Only recently have Labour stepped up in the polls and overtaken the Conservative Party. Now, that for me is quite worrying, and it stems from the fact it's about like what's happening in Europe, it's happening in America. People are sick and tired of those who want to be ambiguous and ambivalent about issues. This is a leadership issue. I believe passionately that, that Britain should remain in the European Union. It's a great edifice, a great historical purpose to the whole uh, operation. We should be celebrating that. But instead, the party has decided to look at the Brexit vote, be concerned about upsetting people when the nation's crying out for leadership. On the simple point, Alec, that somebody needs to put the country first. Sounds a bit old fashioned. Put Britain first instead of the future of the Conservative Party. If the Conservative Party folds tomorrow, I won't be too upset. If Britain folds tomorrow as a country that's respected in the world, a country that's now started to dismantle itself, that worries me enormously. Britain, in terms of keeping Britain as, a, as an entity, doesn't have many friends left in, uh, in European circles. No, I mean, I think the way that the government's going is we're going to create a lesser United Kingdom in one way or t'other. I mean, we're being humiliated abroad. We're diminishing um, Britain to Brits. Uh, in the country. So it's a sad, sad situation. But if you look at Western democracies, if you look at the United States, 
Uh, you can see the rise of stuff that worries me in terms of economic hard men. You could see Islamophobia, you see authoritarianism. There's a great deal of that in the current Conservative Party at Westminster, um, you know, by the ideologues who want to take us out. But for me, an important issue will be um, how the Europeans view developments. Now, we've seen what's happened in Spain with the Catalans, we've seen happens in Scotland. And for a lot of them who are really, I suppose, fed up, that's the word, fed up with, with um, the Westminster government, they may have to take a different view of life because the European Union itself will have to evolve and transform itself over a period. It doesn't look like that one is much of an option. For. No, but that's my worry because I constantly argue, I constantly write, I, and in books as well as articles, that federalism is a worthwhile and reasonable argument against the current mess at Westminster and, and independence. But despite the fact that I've tried hard and hard and hard, no one's listening. There is still this problem at Westminster that they believe that the kind of union it was struck, the un union of the United Kingdom, it still remains. And people find it very hard to envisage a situation where Northern Ireland could have a different geography, political geography. Wales can, Scotland has. And my fear is, because that's never really changed that much, people are sleepwalking at Westminster, closer to a potential breakup of Britain. And unless they stop themselves and do something about it, then that will continue. Now, that is a crisis that's looming. Now, Henry McLeish, you spent a great deal of your academic career in recent years in the United States, lecturing uh, uh, mainly, and some books uh, also about the about United States. So you must uh, be... Uh, watching the, the advent of Trumpism with, uh, with great interest and, and a, a fair bit of consternation, I suspect. Well, um, certainly, Alec. I mean, I, I, I love America. It's a wonderful, wonderful country. I spent two to three months teaching. But this time when I came back in, in April, I, I really had a, a Trump detox. I mean, I, I had so much of, of this person. And one of the sad features is that people are still surprised that he's doing these things. And if we stop being surprised about President Trump, then we could maybe start to concentrate on some of the things that he's actually doing, um, which may be a bit more objective, like what's happening in terms of NATO, what was happening in terms of um, his meeting with uh, President Putin, what he's been saying about winding up the EU in terms of smashing the administrative uh, state, his views on um, uh, people, um, immigrants, his views on Mexicans. There's a whole panoply of issues where people think that he is a politician, he's a Republican. Of course he's not a Republican. He was a Democrat, but of course he's not a Democrat. This is a person who I think is dangerous. And what is dangerous about it, that he's keeping company and stirring up people like Netanyahu. And we're talking about Erdogan uh, in Turkey. We're talking about Duarte in the Philippines. We're talking about communist presence of China and of Russia. And these are the economic hard men we're talking about. So let's concentrate on what President Trump is actually doing and be less surprised when he does something really crazy, really silly. Um, and the quicker we get off that, we'll start to realise that this is a person who's a, a magician in terms of communications. He feeds his base daily and it's remaining substantially loyal. And I would also say to people who think he may only be there for another two years, think again. Because American politics has a problem that the Democrats are not scoring many winning runs, to use a, a metaphor over there, and there's a lack of leadership. So that country has got major, major problems. And I see a lot of what's happening with Trump, in a curious way, inside part of the Conservative Party in relation to this hard economic nationalism, the ideology of free trade, knocking the European Union. These are all qualities that Trump has. It's sad to think that people in the Conservative Party might have similar views. And is every single thing that uh, President Trump does or says wrong? No. And this is, the, this is the curious thing about part of the magic, because there's often an inkling, an inkling of progressive thinking or a sensible idea. For example, in terms of NATO, it makes sense to me that the members of NATO should contribute more to the common defence of the free world. Now, Trump made that point rather inelegantly, but nevertheless, that was a point that hit home. One of, the thing, one of the things Trump has done, he speaks plainly. And that, I think, goes down well with a lot of people, working people, who just don't want the frills, they want substance. The people that have been forgotten in America are the left behinds here. Similar vote with Brexit, similar vote with Trump. 
But let's just ease off ridiculing the man. He's ridiculed himself enough. The more important thing is what is his policies doing to America and how do they impact on the wider world? And that includes Europe, it includes Britain. Henry McLeish, on the, the theme of uplifting Scotland, they're looking forward to toasting either a World Cup win or a independence in four World Cups time. Uh, I brought you the Alex Salmon Quake, which you're entitled for your performance in the show, but uh, you, I don't need to tell you the drill of all people. You know what to do. <laughs> Whiskey it, in the Quake indeed. and your many friends. And I can finish off by promising you that Scotland will qualify for the World Cup, but I'll keep you guessing on what the other part of the question's answer might be. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. Thank you. Henry McLeish is by no means alone in having his mind on future political options concentrated by impending Brexit. And Scotland's future is only one of the looming conflicts that Brexit is now crystallising. The Irish border question remains unresolved, and the Good Friday peace now looks more at risk than at any time over the last two decades. Theresa May's grip on a tenuous Commons majority is shaky, with the Chequers agreement only grudgingly supported by tiny majorities as the least worst option. The question is, can she hold the support of the Democratic Unionists and the European Reform Group while simultaneously tacking enough towards a soft Brexit to satisfy our pro-European rebels. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister's chances of getting her Chequers compromise past the European Commission, 27 other member states and the European Parliament look even less promising than the maintenance of her tiny parliamentary majority. More than two years after the Brexit referendum, we have reached the place where the government briefing on stockpiling food and medicine is actually designed to reassure the population. Public opinion for the first time since the referendum seems to be shifting against Brexit and decisively against the Prime Minister's handling of it. If a soft Brexit is undeliverable and a hard Brexit unthinkable, then the prospect of another referendum, indeed perhaps and another election, becomes a very real likelihood. When the MPs broke up for recess last week, the atmosphere was febrile as the temperatures soared. The holidays may cool tempers, but the underlying issues will be back with a vengeance come the autumn. Last year, the Prime Minister went on a walking holiday and planned a surprise election. This summer, she has two walking tours on her agenda and might end up with an unplanned election and, for Brexiteers at least, an unwanted new referendum. Nothing is now certain, except that the British ship of state is lurching towards a treacherous and indefinite shore. So from Tasmina, myself and all of the crew at the Alex Salmon Show, it's goodbye for now. Coming up in next week's show, I head to bustling Barcelona, where there is continuing deadlock in the political crisis between Catalonia and Spain. I speak exclusively to the new president of Catalonia, Quim Torra, as to whether there can be a breakthrough with new Spanish Prime Minister, Pedro Sanchez.